I think I just saw everything in whether I agreed to the idea, I would stick to it. And if I didn't agree to any form of the idea, I would leave. Um, I was very um, binary um, as a kid, as a teenager, as, as a young person in her 20s. And I didn't like the way, um, which sounds now so arrogant, but sadly that's the way I was in my early 20s. I didn't like the way history of art was taught. I thought it was dead. Um, I thought you couldn't really connect with the artist. You couldn't really connect with the visuals. Um, and and so I therefore express that and and drop out, which obviously is very obnoxious. Um, but it kind of shaped me to be an entrepreneur because then I just I basically went on to do every single thing I felt was the right thing to do and and took enormous risk um, on the back of it. So I was a young Gary director for Steve Lazaridis when I was 21 in London. I then got poached but an investor who was based in Los Angeles who had an advertising company two years on from that and Hanma and Gary in Los Angeles. And then after having met Michael Levitz, um, who had built CAA, then therefore decided to drop again on my um, partnership to build the first high agency in the art world. I think, you know, it's a mix of ignorance and it's also a mix of being absolutely non-compromising is the answer because I just, you know, every time I had the most incredible opportunities and I was in a very privileged position, uh, but it didn't feel quite right until it felt right, which is the company I've built. Um, and ever since I've been someone that has built foundations, got people to join it and and got to scale it. You know, I've been the opposite personality since I found what I wanted to do. But I think until until then, I refused to commit to any ideas that I wasn't fully into. Mm-hmm. And you started, um, you chose to start an agency for artists. Why did you choose that specific, um, that specific business? I think, so again, I think the early part of my 20s to the first six years into the art world are, you know, I'm definitely very competitive as a personality and, and I wanted I wanted to understand how the sector was working. So I was striving to get to the top positions to understand how this was turning. Um, but then as I ran this gallery in Beverly Hills and, and as I was starting having not only, you know, a good reputation, a level of um, sales, a level of everything I would have wanted, it just didn't feel right still. And when Michael Levitz taught me how he built CAA, and I was lucky to therefore start to be mentored by him when I was 23, I was just really interested in how he saw talents as something much more human than the sector. So the, the sector sees art as a dead object that is almost this luxury items. Um, mm-hmm. It's very much devoted to the creator in some ways. Um, the, the way he perceived talent in the music, film, and acting sectors felt much more fluid. It felt um, human. It felt you could extrapolate many things from just a single person. Like Mm -hmm. your actress was not just doing a top movie. She was also um, having an amazing brand campaign. Uh, She will have a very powerful um, um, communication strategy. There was so much more to her than just what she was doing. and I, I just felt like you could do this with visual artists. And, and I don't know how much you know about the talent sector, but sportive used to be really underappreciated up until the 80s, 90s. And now, you know, you would never think of a sportive as an underappreciated talent. Like they are, you know, people you want to sign, people you want to build the carry off. And, mm-hmm. and I felt this was um, the visual artists I really loved, deserved the same thing. And also because... I I have very strong liberal um, and left-wing political views. I felt therefore it would help um, building a new stream of revenues behind talents, which meant that all type of talents could become talents in an overtly privileged sector. Mm -hmm. And also that I would help to bring new audiences through bringing new types of revenues to my talents. So it it was really kind of... um, very satisfying moment because the economics and the social values just aligned in a way that just, I didn't expect them to make sense because my sector is, you know, very high net worth driven. 
and my views are much more left wing. So I did, I never expected them to come hand to hand. And actually, the the solution fund um, behind the agency got the economics and the social values to completely kind of meet and and to be the strengths of one another, which felt amazing. And subsequently, mm-hmm. we also became the first B Corp company um, in the art world in the UK on the back of this. I think we continued that stories through that. Okay. And so, I mean, let's jump to the artist side of things because I'm really interested in actually um, how you market an artist effectively and all the revenue streams and so on. But let's start at the very beginning. Um, How do artists traditionally promote themselves? You know, before a company like yourselves, like Mm -hmm. an agency for artists, um, is there, you know, so what or how do artists promote themselves so being traditionally, business, traditionally? Traditionally, it's drastically evolved. Obviously, in the 80s, 90s, you would be lucky to be exhibited on a wall and that would be the only way you would be perceived um, in the world um, because that was the only way someone could interact with your work, that if you were displayed on the walls of a gallery, on the walls of a museum. Yes. Um, of course, my generation of artists has kind of, had it I think in a much better way because suddenly with social media you could tell your story and you could be seen by much larger audiences even if you didn't have access to a wall Mm -hmm. um, which meant you could include countries that were before this not included you could include backgrounds that before this were not included so the the communication side I think really kind of changed everything and I think not to forget as well that PR agencies in the sector are very expensive. So it's also democratized the access on how you could tell your own story, um, which I think is very powerful. Mm-hmm. I think that what, where we really make a difference is, you know, we, so I look at every artist as a 360 strategy. I think every single one of them wants something completely different of what the strategy they would want. So we completely tailor it to them. But I think to kind of give you major achievements, which I nobody else can do in the sector. So we closed the Sean Mars in Paris, which is 800 meters long um, with the Eiffel Tower, 30 companies, the mayor of Paris, and had this 800 meters, basically the longest public art painting in the world with our artist SAPE. SAPE, when you had this, was 29, just made it to the full 13 or 30, then had this. No galleries in the sector could have got in this. And mm-hmm. it's a completely new type of deal where you have, back to the inspiration of, CAA, but you have partnerships and packaging behind talents mm-hmm. where here you have a media partnership, you have 30 companies financing it, you have a public um, a public um, office like the mayor of Paris backing it. So we will package very powerful deals which enable suddenly a much larger audience, but also a much uh, bigger ambition than I think this kind of talents is used to have. Okay, so just to just to clarify, so before <laughs> our social media, you needed to be up on a gallery, right? Um, but but that yeah. was the way in predominantly, and then probably mostly with Instagram, it feels um, that that kind of opened up the visual artists um, to have um, kind of exposure to audiences that they didn't have before. But that still doesn't close the loop on actually how they make money from this whole thing, does it? That's like they're getting an audience. Um, but yeah. they're not generally creating um, enough revenue to live off the oftentimes. Is that a true statement or is that not a true statement? Or- I think, yes or no. I think social media was powerful. Is again, your story was told by other people. You couldn't tell your, your story in the first place. Um, so that's the game changer. And I think even someone like me, so 90% of the sector comes from very privileged backgrounds. The fact that I don't, but I could tell my story and get people to back me is I think an example of what social media can bring in in a time like this. Mm -hmm. Um, The revenue, I think is, well, I agree that audiences don't do everything, but in the case of the public art project, I gave as an example, and you know, my first boss was spotted Banksy and JR, their audiences became their strengths. It became their, their worst as well and their values. So they can have a Cannes festival or cities committing to doing project with them in the case of JR because of the audience that they have. So I think audiences are incredibly powerful. And in all talent sectors, they are really, it's thanks to the agency that the talents have their power as well. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so you have all the agents and they put together like all these um 
like events and so on. And so that's another core component, right? And so your approach is taking it to like another level, like for example, um, the project that you did in Paris. Are there other examples of these types of projects where, you know, it puts it together and it creates something which wasn't there before? Yes, I think the way we build them, there's four different arms on how we build them. There's the arms of the traditional arm, which is selling their works, getting museums to back them. Then you have the communication arms, making sure everyone knows they're the next rising star that would just ever be seen as such. The third arm is the public art. So a public art deal can be up to half a million and million plus. So this is not just organizing uh, organizing an event, you know, it is breaking ultimately a partnership with a city, a government or multiple public bodies, which is very financially viable um, for artists at that level. And that's the reason why we're able to get artists from very prestigious traditional models because they can't get this anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you have the brand collaborations, which were also very new for the past few years, where suddenly we did a partnership with the Californian company Method and over 1 million projects with three artists and them that we had put on all their bottles sold within just three months in the UK supermarkets. So the idea of generally bringing up to the shelves of supermarkets, which is completely disrupting because the same artists will be exhibiting at Christie's mm. and selling for thousands of pounds per works. So I think I just had, and I think it was back to kind of, you know, I have been raised by a traditional sector professionally to start with. So in a sense, I've had six years in a traditional sector. So I'm able to have a partnership with Christie's, which we've had. I'm able to understand how collectors work. I'm able to develop networks that will back the artists. But equally, I never wanted to just be in the luxury side of things for them. I wanted to make sure we could position mainstream deals, which I believe in the long term will be much more valuable revenue-wise and reputation-wise than the luxury ones. Mm. Um, And that's what's starting happening because, because the audiences are much larger and because suddenly they become much larger role models, people that you look up to, people that you're inspired Mm -hmm. by, they are actually much more game-changing for their carriers than just a pure luxury market. And I think from a luxury market perspective, um, um, it's a lot more subjective and there's a lot fewer kind of art collectors than there are companies who want to have a cool kind of imagery on some promotion, right? So like it seems like you're uh, disrupting the traditional way that art is are distributed, you know? So before it was like, you know, it was very exclusive and now it's becoming, you know, just more, um, I guess, accessible um, to like a lot more people. Like, is that a fair statement? Yeah, I think when I'm excited, I'm not excited about the art world. I'm excited about a visual sector in which the urban realm, the advertising sector belongs to that. And I want to share for visual talents um, in that visual sector. I think you, right now, have never consumed so many visuals in your entire life than in the past 10 years. <laughs> you consume visuals constantly. They're everywhere. They mm. are, you know, on the ads, digitally. And artists has so few shares um, of those visuals. And the advertising sector knows it is the key to get to your brain. In two seconds, if they use visuals, they will get you to think something much faster than if they speak or if they put a word to it. Mm. And yet, you know, visual artists barely tap any revenue from this. They don't get any shares or any voice really within mm. this sector. And they're still confined to something that's really conservative, a bit broken because almost two thirds of galleries were already on making money before COVID um, and, and just outdated and not mm. like a language, it's just very outdated as objects in the yeah. luxury space. Mm. 